We all know that mental health is a huge issue in our community. The Productivity Commission's recent issues paper ahead of its mental health inquiry notes that Mental illness is the single largest contributor to years lived in ill health and is the third largest contributor, after cancer and cardiovascular conditions, to a reduction in the total years of healthy life for Australians. Almost half of all Australian adults have met the diagnostic criteria for an anxiety, mood or substance use disorder at some point in their lives, and around 20% will meet the criteria in a given year. In this episode, All In Your Head, we're talking about mental health from the perspective of workplace health and safety. How do we view mental health at work? What are organisations doing? And what are their duties? Within workplaces, mental health is receiving growing attention. There are a few reasons for this, in addition to our general increased focus on mental health across the community. One reason is that work has often been used as a vehicle for promoting health. According to the World Health Organization, The workplace directly influences the physical, mental, economic and social well-being of workers, and in turn, the health of their families, communities and society. It offers an ideal setting and infrastructure to support the promotion of health of a large audience. Workplace health promotion programs started after World War II and have since been used to target a range of issues such as hypertension, diabetes, diet and nutrition, smoking and fitness. They're sometimes tied up with perks and privileges, such as gym access, and other times strategies such as doctor's visits or on-site health screening. Work is a great way to reach a lot of people efficiently, especially when many of those people might never go and see their doctor. It works for health, so why not mental health? Of course, mental health is just health. So organisations are starting to put more of an emphasis on mental health at work, and they're being pressured to do that by the community, where, as we all know, rates of suicide and depression are unacceptably high. The second reason is that mental health, or psychological health, as it's more often referred to in this context, is now recognised as being part of the duties organisations have within workplace health and safety. It's not that that's a new addition, even though it might feel that way. Workplace health and safety has included psychological health implicitly for decades. And of course, now it's explicit. It's there in the stated definition of health used in safety. Health means physical and psychological health. So every time the law says health, it includes psychological health. In addition, we've had guidance on issues like stress, and notably more recently, bullying, for many years. There is new guidance in Australia titled Work-Related Psychological Health and Safety, and that's been agreed by the safety regulators, the unions and the employers. Tripartite agreement. And that's a big deal. There's also a new international standard on occupational health and safety management systems, and that explicitly states that an employer has to identify hazards, including how work is organised, social factors, including workload, work hours, victimisation, harassment and bullying, leadership and the culture of the organisation. And let's not forget that there's also the review of Australia's workplace health and safety laws, which recommended placing psychological health within regulations. Regulations are a more detailed set of requirements, and they help interpret the legislation. They're a step above codes of practice and guidance materials. I guess what I'm saying is that there is a slew of regulatory information and guidance and standards that's all pointing in one direction, and that is that psychological health is part of workplace health and safety duties. So everything should be fine, right? In terms of what organisations are doing about psychological health, for the most part, what seems to be happening is what's referred to as mental health promotion. There may be some companies going beyond that, but if they are, they should be shouting it from the rooftops. Mental health promotion covers all the activities you might do to make people more aware 
of mental health issues. For example, providing information on what particular conditions look like and feel like, such as depression and anxiety. Talking about these issues normalises the experience, taking away the stigma, and most importantly, it makes it normal and okay and acceptable to put your hand up for help. Mental health promotion often takes the form of morning teas and special events, seminars and calls to action. Sometimes there are classes or meditation sessions, massages, blending into the kind of strategies that many organisations label as wellness or well-being. Mental health promotion in itself is a good thing, showing people that what they might be experiencing is okay and normal and that they're not alone and that help is available is a really positive and important message. It's within the orbit of what organisations should be doing about mental health at work, but it's nowhere near the core of their workplace health and safety responsibilities in this area. What they should be focusing more on is psychosocial risk prevention, thinking about what things at work negatively impact people's mental health and addressing them before they have an effect, just like any other hazard. The hazards to be controlled are all listed in the guidance. They're things like the amount, schedule and pace of work, the amount of control people can have over their work, sometimes called decision latitude, as well as role conflict and ambiguity, relationship, supervision and support. The key control strategy for these hazards is work design. That doesn't mean knocking the organisation down and rebuilding it. It just means working collaboratively to better understand how the work is done and how it could be done better. Mental health promotion is a good thing. But in the context of an organisation's duties, it's reactive rather than proactive, and it tends to focus on individual levels of intervention when the focus should be on work and work systems. We see a lot of pamphlets, Tai Chi courses and resilience training, all of which are more promotional and individual rather than preventative and systemic. There appear to be a few barriers in thinking that are preventing us from moving from mental health promotion to psychosocial risk prevention. It's like an incomplete picture of mental health at work. I've developed a model to explain this incomplete picture. It's more of an acronym really, but anyway. It's the SCALP model of mental health at work. S, static and binary. CA, clinical assessment. L, lunch. Don't worry, I'll explain that. And P, productivity and performance. SCALP. Let's take a closer look at the model. All the parts are interrelated, of course, and describe the limited way in which we might view mental health at work. Static and binary refers to how we so often view mental health at work as something that is static and unchanging and binary. You've either got a mental health condition or you don't, and once you've got it, you've always got it. Of course, we know that's wrong. People's mental health changes just like the rest of their health. It changes over time due to lots of things, including treatment and their experiences. It's much more dynamic than we often think. The Productivity Commission recognised this when they wrote in a white paper that their ongoing inquiry is about the mental health and well-being of Australia's population generally, not only about people with a diagnosed mental illness. A person without a diagnosable mental illness could be experiencing escalating or sustained psychological distress, which reduces their participation in and contribution to society. Conversely, a person with a history of mental illness might have a high level of mental health because they have the right treatments and supports to be able to take part in activities that are meaningful, such as work or study, providing a sense of purpose and positive self-perception. But back to scalp. Clinical assessment. This is the tendency to only think about people who have diagnoses, which of course is important. But there's also a lot of negative effects on people who either haven't been diagnosed or wouldn't meet diagnostic criteria. Negative effects on people's mental health don't have to be of a clinical nature to be important. 
In health and safety, it's about preventing harm, not just about preventing harm over a certain threshold. Lunch. My favourite meal of the day, but also the tendency in workplace mental health to think that mental health is something that individuals bring with them, like they bring their lunch. It's almost a blame thing. You and your stuff coming to work for the rest of us to have to deal with. Of course, the thing that is overlooked here is that the focus should be on what people take away with them. In other words, how work affects health. That's the very core of workplace health and safety. Performance and productivity. This is the tendency to think about mental health affecting people's performance and productivity, rather than thinking about how their performance and productivity and mental health are affected by work and organisational design. None of this is to diminish the difficulties experienced by those who do have a clinically diagnosed condition that they might or might not choose to disclose. Not at all. This example from the website Business in the Community from the UK shows how work can contribute to mental health and then mental health conditions can also sometimes be used against people. Julia resigned from her job as a teacher after being bullied by management over a period of six months, during which her GP prescribed medication to treat anxiety and depression. Julia felt that her mental health was used as a way to oust her. Workplace culture is key in making people feel confident in speaking up about their mental health. Work had always been stressful due to high workloads and unmet training needs. But Julia didn't realise how stressed she was until she experienced a panic attack on the way to work. I was shaking and crying. When I got close to work, my stomach would take a turn. I wasn't in a good place. Julia's anxiety continued, and when her line manager came into her office, she took the opportunity to tell her how she was feeling and flag that she was unable to cope. At first, my line manager said that it was okay and not to worry, but then she used what I told her as a way to attack me. She ranked the pressure up. She wanted me to resign. So instead of scalp, we can think of mental health at work as being dynamic and changing, being both clinical and subclinical, being taken home from work, and being affected by work tasks and work design. This kind of view sets a foundation for being able to manage risks to people's psychological health. And that's where we need to start. <laughs>